After decades of hard work and anticipation, the moment has finally arrived. The James Webb Space Telescope, the largest space observatory in history, is poised to launch. With a hundred times the observational power of Hubble, the JWST promises countless new discoveries about our incredible universe, including vital clues about whether we humans are truly alone. I'm really thrilled to be speaking today with Natasha Battaglia. She is an exoplanet scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. Thank you so much for talking with us, Natasha. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, we definitely want to get into all of the cool things you're doing in your career right now, including um, the imminent launch of Webb, James Webb Space Telescope. But to start, I just wondered, uh, how did you first get interested in science? What's sort of your journey toward this uh, amazing project with Webb? My parents are actually both astrophysicists and they really helped break down the barriers for me to enter the field. I, When I was a kid, I had such culturally ingrained stereotypes of what a scientist looks like or should look like. Even me, the daughter of a female scientist and a Latino scientist, and that was evidenced by this exercise that my mom made me do when I was little to draw a picture of an astronaut. And I drew just the most stereotypical image of what an astronaut might look like. And when my mom asked me why I had done that, I, you know, had, it, it made me really stop and think. And I think that that sort of empowered me on this journey to pursue uh, space sciences and planetary scientists. I think it's a very common um, experience to imagine uh, that. And I'm so glad that your mom was so creative about that. I, I understand that she is also you know, a leading exoplanet researcher. Is it like now a family tradition to <laughs> you know, be looking at worlds and other solar systems? No, not at all. I mean, we I have three other siblings and they're not as interested in space sciences as, as I am. So dinner conversations do not revolve around exoplanets. <laughs> so people think that for sure. Um, yeah. That's so funny. I, I love the kitchen table talk idea and your and your household being like at least partially. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, in terms of exposure, that is something my parents totally did provide me with. Uh, in elementary school, I had to do a book report on a famous American, and I chose to do a report on Sally Ride, who was an incredible person, first female astronaut, for the first U.S. female astronaut. And at the end of her, one of the biographies that I had read, she has almost this call to action for future generations of, of scientists, and she says that you know, you are going to be the, the one who really looks for signs of life on Mars. And and I that was so powerful to me. And so it's it's that kind of exposure that I think my parents had, a, you know, did a really great job for me as a, as a young, young kid interested in science. Well, clearly, because now you're part of this team that is literally on the most important telescope. <laughs> I mean, this, uh, this, James Webb Space Telescope has been in the works for decades and it's so highly anticipated. So can you just give us a sense right now, being so close finally to this to this launch, um, what you and your colleagues are feeling leading up to it? There have been over 1,200 people involved in building the James Webb Space Telescope, not to include the over 3,000 people spread across 450 different institutions in 40 different countries who are all going to be involved in analyzing the first year of JWST data. So there's just, you know, the magnitude of the energy of, uh, and the excitement is just, it's so incredible. Yeah, and I think it's uh, really, you know, seeped through the public to lots of public excitement about this launch. But for someone who had never heard of Webb, how would you explain what it is and why it is so significant? Yeah, so the, the James Webb Space Telescope is the biggest most complex telescope we have ever launched into space. Compared to Hubble, it is nearly three times as big. So in total, it's almost the size of a tennis court. So it's huge. Unlike Hubble, which observed in the visible light, the James Webb Space Telescope is gonna look primarily at infrared light. And so that improved sensitivity in combination with this new wavelength range is going to nearly revolutionize, you know, nearly every aspect of astrophysics from looking at 
the very first stars and galaxies that were born in the universe to searching for life in the planets that orbit these distant stars. It's interesting to me too that it's launching from French Guiana. Are, are you going to be able to be at the site you think or do you have plans for where you're going to be for the launch? Oh man, I wish, you know, given the state of the pandemic, it's yeah. it's really important for just the people who are really critical to ensuring a successful launch for them to be there. As a scientist, my job kicks in after the telescope has been commissioned. And so I'll be anxiously watching with all of my colleagues and collaborators at home. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's after after so much uh, hard work and planning, I'm sure that uh, 10 minute time frame where it's going <laughs> this space is a lot of elevated heart rates out there. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and the crazy thing is it's not only 10 minutes, you know, the oh, really? the the launch sequence of JWST is so complex, is so complex, you know, it's really origami in the Ariane 5 rocket. And so from from just for it to arrive where to its final destination is going to take an entire month. Uh, so it, it'll be really interesting to be watching the telescope for, you know, for that entire month long period. And it's going to take a month to get there as it's going, uh, it's going to unfurl, I'm guessing. Could you describe yes. a little bit about that process? Yeah, totally. So within the first day, right after launch, we'll see the high gain ant uh, antenna unfurl. And that's so we can actively and effectively communicate with the telescope. En route to L2, it's gonna, the first thing that's gonna come out then is the sun shield so that the telescope can kind of start cooling down. That's gonna take, that's gonna happen within the first week. And then in, within the first month, all of the other uh, elements of the telescope will start to unfurl themselves. And so within a month, you'll see it reach its final destination in the orbit around L2. Then from that point, we have another five months of calibrating all of the different instruments. There are four different instruments on board the telescope, and it's really important that we go through systematically each one and make sure everything is in tip-top shape so that we can do our science. And so from launch to when we actually get science, that's going to be a six-month window. And so we'll start getting data six months after launch. Could you talk also just about how much more sensitive it will be than say the Hubble mm -hmm. or other existing telescopes right now? Yeah, so when it comes to sensitivity, it's really all about how much light collecting power you have. And that's where the mirrors on JWST, the, the size of that telescope is really gonna give us that extra boost. So like I said before, the, the Webb Space Telescope is nearly three times bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope. That gives it about a six and a quarter times the light collecting power that you get. And so that's gonna give you nearly three times just the, the straight uh, precision or sensitivity. That combined with the fact that JWST now has this extra wavelength coverage that's gonna extend what Hubble did by a factor of 10 gives the the combination of those two things lets hubble see things that can be up to a hundred times fainter than what hubble ever saw and so it really is going to extend what hubble did dramatically in terms of you know observational capability so this is really like the most powerful telescope ever launched into space <laughs> yeah to totally by a lot, <laughs> by a lot. <laughs> So exciting. <laughs> Cannot wait for all of these steps to, to be going through sequence and for us to get the first observations. And to that point, I, I understand you already have observation time, I think, on web to look at uh, the atmospheres of planets. Yes. That is really cool. And I just, <laughs> I mean, who doesn't love talking about worlds and star systems? Can you talk a little bit about your uh, project and the kind of targets you're going to be looking at with web? Yeah. Absolutely. I am, I'm co-leading a team with a, another brilliant scientist at Carnegie. Her name is Johanna Tusky. And we are, we aim to look at 11 kind of funky planets that are a little bit bigger than Earth, but a little bit smaller than Neptune. Hmm. You know, one of the greatest exoplanet discoveries, you know, in, in the last just decade has been that the diversity of planet that exists within the galaxy far exceeds the diversity of planet that we see in our own solar system. Within our own solar system, you know, we have the terrestrial planets like Earth and Mars, and then we have the gas giants like Jupiter and Neptune. But there's really nothing in between that. But what we found was that the most common type of planet that exists in the galaxy 
are those in-between planets that exist just slightly bigger than Earth and just slightly smaller than Neptune. So this is weird. And so we're going to look at 11 of these kind of in-between planets and determine what their chemical compositions are because encoded in these chemical compositions is rich information about how these planets formed and how they evolved. And we're interested in that because if we can understand that process, we can understand sort of what building blocks are necessary to, to, to create a habitable environment. And what kind of things will you be looking for in these atmospheres that uh, especially might shed light on the habitability of these kinds of worlds? Yeah, so we are really interested in looking at molecules that are common here on Earth. Things like water and methane and carbon dioxide. A lot of the planets that we're going to be observing in this program are not necessarily uh, habitable. They, they, they don't necessarily have temperate climates, but there are other observing programs on the James Webb Space Telescope within the first year that are going to look at more temperate climates. Uh, one of the most interesting systems that JWST is going to be really good at searching for uh, biosignatures or atmospheric markers in the planets, in temperate planets that orbit cool stars. And there's a really interesting system that's going to be observed in JWST's first year called the TRAPPIST-1 system that has three of these potentially habitable temperate planets. That is really exciting. And that TRAPPIST system just seems like a wash with so many interesting worlds. I'm wondering too, if there's any um, chance that Webb could capture like signs of techno signatures from actually intelligent life. I know that's quite speculative, but is it more optimized to see like, I don't know, ozone, things like that, and less to see uh, radio signals or megastructures or some of the other things that have been hypothesized as signs of intelligent life. A technosignature is any sort of signature that is produced by technology as opposed to biosignatures, which we were discussing, that are signatures produced by biology. Radio signals, as you mentioned, are not within JWST's reach because the wavelength regions are just not there. Within the field of atmospheric science, one interesting uh, techno signature that has been uh, sort of discussed is atmospheric pollution. That is something that could potentially have a direct atmospheric imprint on our spectra and would be a sign of, of machinery and not necessarily biology. So let's, let's speculate a little bit. We look at the TRAPPIST system. One of the planets has this very compelling, you know, biosignatures, looks like it could be Earth, looks like it could be habitable or even inhabited. That's sort of different from the scenario of aliens visiting us or having a clear radio signal. What would be the reaction uh, for NASA in terms of uh, telling the public about that? And also like, would we be able to get there ever? I mean, it's 40 light years away. Like it's kind of so close, but so far feeling. Could you kind of comment on that? One thing to remember is that any sort of claim like that will go through the rigorous scientific process where someone will write up their results, it will be analyzed by peer reviews and would be, or, or peers, and would be eventually published in a journal. Now, in this first year of, of web science, we're just going to be scratching the surface. And so if we found something that looked like, you know, that, that looked Earth-like, or if we found something that had a, a this balance of carbon dioxide and methane that could indicate potential life. There are so many other instruments on board JWST that we can actually, that we will use to follow up those measurements. Because you have to remember that in each one of these observations, you're looking at kind of a narrow wavelength range. And you really want to get as, as a complete picture as possible. And so it's not going to be the case where it's just a one and done observation and we've done it. It's going to be this multi-step process where we analyze the same planet over again, maybe in the same instruments to increase the precision of our observation, or we expand the wavelength pit coverage to gain additional context to improve our temperature measurements, because it's not just about determining the atmospheric composition. We also want to get a really deep understanding of what the climate is like as well. If we do find something that looks kind of like a smoking gun, it, we'll have to revisit as a community what the next big questions that can be answered 
for that particular system. And it might not be tra the Trappist system, it might be something completely different. Let's go into the very deep past then. I think that's the one area that we, um, or one of the many areas we haven't covered yet, because I know this telescope is going to <laughs> discover so much. But um, how deep into the universe's past can it look? And, and what is it, what are some of the big questions there that uh, Webb can help resolve? Though, you know, exoplanet atmospheres is near and dear to my heart, there's gonna be so much other great science like you just said. The JWST is going to be able to peer back to about 100, a mil, 100 million to just 250 million years after the universe was born. This is a region where we think those first stars, those first galaxies were forming. You know, it is pretty crazy to think about the fact that the, the oxygen that we enjoy here on Earth was actually itself born in one of these initial star forming, galaxy forming, regions. One of the things that I really love about your career, Natasha, is that you have this GitHub page that has like all of this amazing free information, like software tools. I was I was just having such a blast reading through it. You know, so if so if anyone wants to learn more about the work that you do, they can go on and, and, and learn and use these tools. So why is it so important to you to have that kind of open access environment, uh, both for your community, but also for anybody? You know, science should only be driven by the the best most creative ideas it really shouldn't be dictated by what access you have to certain tools especially because limited access is you know usually predominantly affects people who are part of marginalized communities based on race or gender identity or age you know young people trying to get into the field and so I'm, I'm really passionate about ma just making sure that everyone has access to these tools. And especially with JWST, we were really diligent about ensuring that everyone had equal access to the same user-friendly and accessible proposal tools so that they could actually write proposals to, to get time. And what you saw was the highest fraction of, of women-led and student-led proposals uh, compared to what you've seen previously with Hubble. And so this open sci science model where you provide things to everyone, it works. And that's why it's just, it's so important to provide things like that.